If you will, turn to Colossians 1. And in verse 15, I actually made a mistake in the bulletin. Uh, Carolyn was uh, making the bulletin and I gave her the wrong text. Um, I realized that if I stayed with uh, what I was going to give you, I'd probably be going more than an hour and thought that that would not be helpful. And so really what I plan on doing with you is seeing uh, the uh, panorama of verses 15 through 20, kind of st taking a step back and looking at the whole. And before that, I want to review the previous text and the last message um, and the flow of thought. So far that we've seen, Paul has been disclosing a prayer, a prayer that he and others have had for the Colossian believers ever since that they heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the fruit of love that they have for the brothers, all the saints. And the prayer both include thanksgiving and supplication. Thanksgiving to the Father for the hope that is laid up for them in heaven and thanks for the gift of that hope, faith and love, a fruit of that hope, and then supplication for them to the Father. Supplication, if you remember, uh, that they may be filled with the knowledge of His will. And we saw that that was that knowledge, that word knowledge there is a different word that is used typically than what we see in the scriptures for the word of knowledge. We see it's a epi, epi knowledge. It's an epic knowledge. Knowledge of what? His will. His will not being just uh, His specific will for my daily life, but His will, His all-encompassing will, all that He has ever done, all that He is doing right now, and all that He ever will do. And I think specifically in His Son and by His Spirit, His all-encompassing will, Paul is praying to the Father that they would be filled with the knowledge of. And then he says, in order, in order that, let's see, so it's being filled with the knowledge of His all-encompassing will in order that. In other words, this is necessary for this next thing, which is that they may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That they would be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might. And I think that it is here that uh, this is the very heart of the supplication. He's asking for the gift of the working of the Holy Spirit without which none of these graces that he's asking for will happen. That same power which raised Christ from the dead, working in them. This is what Paul is praying for in the supplication. For all endurance and patience with joy. Fruits, those are fruits of the Spirit. Endurance, patience, joy. And if you remember, in John 15, Jesus Christ, when He's talking about, Abide in Me, abide in Me, and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. This is the will of the Father, that you bear much fruit. And at, at the end of that thought, He says that My joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. And I think it's really important that we understand the fruits of the Spirit is something that we are sharing in Christ. Whose joy is it? My joy in you. Or is it my joy? No, it's, it's a shared joy. And if you look at the next chapter, chapter 16, Jesus Christ is talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit's work is to lead us into all truth. And then you continue that thought or you continue reading what uh, Jesus Christ is saying, and then He says, and He will declare what is mine to you. All that the Father has is mine. And I tell you that He'll take what is mine and declare it to you. That declaration, I believe, is like a wedding vow. It's, it's not just teaching. 
and in all truth, but it's taking what is His and declaring it to us. In other words, all that I am, I give to you. All that I have, I share with you. And therefore, whenever we think about the Spirit, we think about the fruits of the Spirit, it is something that we are sharing in the life of Christ. And so, whenever these things are happening in us, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work, it is something that we are communing with Christ in. Um, and that's why I believe that he says, and increasing in the knowledge of God there. This is a relationship with him based on something that God is doing. And so um, he bases this prayer on this reality that the Father has qualified you to share, to become partakers in the inheritance of the saints in light. He, he bases his prayer on this reality. The Father has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us, conveyed us into the Son of His love, the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so what is the confidence that Paul has in his prayer? It is in a giving Father. Paul's confidence is in the giving Father. Think about it. He's thanking in prayer, and then he's asking in prayer. He's thanking the Father for a gift that was given, and he's asking for another gift to be given. His confidence is not in the Colossian believers, but his confidence is in the Father who has given His Son and given His Spirit. Look at the main things that He's asking for. The main things that He's asking for. Well, actually, look before that. Look at the main thing that He's thanking the Father for. The main thing that He is thanking the Father for is the hope that is laid up for them in heaven. That is laid up for us in heaven. Who is that? It is Jesus Christ resurrected at the right hand of the Father. And then whenever you go into the supplication, what is it that he's primarily asking for? He's asking for a work to be done in them by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's asking for the working of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul has his confidence in the Spirit-giving, Son-giving Father. That is, I think, is very important for us to understand. Um, he's anchoring this in the giving Father. And so this shows us that every moment in salvation, every moment in salvation is something that God is doing. It is the Father who is giving the Son, and it is the Father who is giving the Holy Spirit and therefore, the application for us as we read that, as we read his prayer, is we can go to the Father. We can go to the Father on this fact that he is giving, that he has given his Son, and that he gives his Spirit. This is the one of whom it is said in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also not with him also Give us freely all things. Freely give us all things. And then it says in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus Christ is encouraging his disciples. And he says, fear not, little flock. It is of your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We see how giving God is. He gives the son. And then if you look in John Chapter 3, verse 34, Jesus Christ says that He gives the Spirit without measure. Now the context of that is, is that He gives the Son the Spirit without measure. But all that the Father has is mine, and I tell you that all that is mine, He'll declare it to you. That Spirit, that same Spirit in which was poured out on Christ, poured on, out on the head, anointed Jesus Christ, our head flows down to, its to His body. And therefore, 
that, that verse can be applied to us. He gives the Spirit without measure. So again and again and again, the Scriptures point us to the truth that God is giving and forgiving. And He does not withhold. This is what the believers in Colossae were seeing. When they were saved, whenever they heard the gospel, the word of the truth of the gospel, this is what Paul says, they came to understand the grace of God in truth. It is only when they heard the gospel that they understood the grace of God in truth. They were seeing God for who He really is revealed in the gospel. And so if you're going to receive grace, it is only through the gospel. If you're going to receive grace from God, it will be only in His Son, Jesus Christ, and not in any other. At the end of the prayer, Paul says, that in this beloved Son, the, the Son who is loved by the Father, in His Son we are recipients of the fullness of redemption. It's in, in the Son that we receive the inheritance. And Paul wants us to know this. There's, not, there's no grace and favor from God. There's no giving of the Father to us of this inheritance outside the Son. And a brother uh, mentioned to me that it might be helpful to mention something that I had said at, towards the end of the last message. Uh, and I think that it does bear repeating for us to understand the direction and the flow of thought in this letter, the message of this letter. And that's this. In all of the needs that we have in this life as believers, whatever you are lacking in, Think about whatever it is that you are lacking in. Whether it be uh, practical righteousness and obedience, character. Or if you're an unbeliever, if you're lacking that righteousness which you need before God. All that is ever need, needed in this life will only be met in Christ. Christ is sufficient that is the message. Christ is sufficient in every need. And so, each one of the needs that Paul discloses in this prayer, needs that are essential, that are necessary for this life. Paul is disclosing them at the beginning of the letter, such as um, being filled with the knowledge of His will, walking in a worthy manner, being pleasing, fully pleasing to the Lord, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, giving thanks to the Father. All these things are necessary. And it's as if Paul is raising them up at the beginning of the letter and then preaches Christ to them in the rest of the letter. You need to be filled with the epic knowledge of His all-encompassing will. Well, go to Colossians 1. Verse 19, and he would say, Let me show you him in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and in whom the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Colossians 2 verse 9. You need this knowledge in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Colossians 2 verse 3. Let me show you him in whom all the hidden in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You need to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Colossians 2, verse 6. Walk in Him, that is Christ, whom you have received. You need to bear fruit. Colossians 3, verse 10. Paul advises us in that place where we are putting off the old and the need to put on the new. The new man, which is bearing fruit, he says, Be renewed in the knowledge of Christ, the image of your Creator. And you need to do all these things. You need, you need to pursue these things which Paul is praying for. You need to do these things and then give thanks to the Father. Colossians 3, verse 17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of 
of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Christ is sufficient for all these things. Christ is sufficient for all the needs that we have, whatever we are lacking in. Go to Christ. Go to the Father for Christ. And the reason why He is sufficient in all of these things is because of who He is. And that's where we turn now in chapter 1, verse 15. This passage is talking about who Christ is. Starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross." One of the first things that you notice in this passage is how it stands out from the rest of the letter and how distinct it is just by reading it. And it, it, it's distinct in its form. It's distinct in that this is a, a poetic style of writing. This is really an expression of worship. Remember that this is the very heart of the letter. This whole letter is really centered around this message, Christ is preeminent. Everything in the rest of the letter is building in some way on this text, on this passage. And the prayer before is looking ahead towards this and leading to this passage. The reason why this is distinct is because of who this passage is talking about. And this tells us who Christ is. And so, aware of who Christ is, Paul is drawn out to him as, as he's writing. And so, throughout Christian history, this is rightly called the Song of Christ, because Paul is worshiping Christ as he's writing this. In poetic literature, because of its form, you can see that the writer is really expressing more than words like when you read the Song of Songs. You know that what is expressed in the word and, and in, in its form, there are, there's affections expressed, there's desires expressed in the form, in the way that it's written. There is heart language. And you can see it's here in Colossians verses 15 through 20 in the repetition and the parallelisms. It seems that Paul is aware of who Christ is when he's writing, and he's, so, he's affected to the degree that it changes the way that he writes. And I don't think that Paul is thinking, here, let me, let me write in a poetic way in order to try and stir up their affections. No, he's affected. He's affected by what he is thinking about as he is writing, and therefore is writing in such a way that he is worshiping. And one of the signs that this is a, a poetic song is that there's the parallel that we see that is drawn in, in two parts. First, in verses 15 through 17, we see how Christ is preeminent in creation, in all things, that he is the firstborn over all creation. And then in the second part, which is parallel, we see how Christ is first born from the dead, how he is preeminent in all the new creation, in all redemption. It's kind of like in Psalm 148. Uh, if you remember, Brother Jim read 
from Psalm 128, and then he prayed. Well, before, I thought this was really helpful when he um, outlined it for us. You remember what, what the psalm was about? It was about um, praise the Lord, you heavens. So everything in heaven, praise the Lord, angelic hosts. Everything in, in heaven, praise the Lord. And then earth, everything in earth, praise you, the Lord. Praise the Lord, everything, you rocks, you mountains, you streams. Everything praise the Lord. And then specifically, you saints, you his people, praise the Lord. And we see that in some way here in Colossians verses 15 through 20. It's, it's really divided in two things. Add the heavens and the earth together. Christ is preeminent in all things, all things in heaven and all things in earth. Christ is preeminent in all creation. And then... Starting in verse 18, Christ is preeminent in all redemption, in all new things, in all the new creation. And one of the uh, ways it might be able, we might be able to see more noticeably how this is a, uh, an expression of worship, that this is a song, is in the repetition. Look at the repetition. What is the scope of what this passage is talking about? The scope is all things. Look at the end of verse 15. The firstborn over all creation. Next verse. For by him all things were created. Next sentence. All things were created through him and for him. Next sentence in the next verse. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. The end of the next verse, in verse 18, that in him all things he may have the preeminence. Next verse, very important. For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. The end of verse 20, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. I wonder if the message is clear. You don't need literary forms. You don't need to know literary forms and uh, the styles of, of literary form in order to understand the message here. All you need to do is listen to it. This is talking about Christ preeminent in all things. Christ is all in all. And one thing to notice is this. Why? The reason why Christ is preeminent in all in all, in all things, is because this is how the Father sees Him. Jesus is all in all to the Father. Jesus Christ is the Father's beloved Son. Trace back who the subject is. All that we've been seeing so far is He and Him and His. And we know who this is talking about. This is talking about Jesus Christ. Look at the end of verse 20. Making peace by the blood of His cross. But try to find where the subject is clearly identified. His. So we still have His cross there. Trace back to verse 13. Look specifically at who Paul has in mind when he's speaking about Christ in this way, that he's preeminent in all things. Verse 13, He, the Father, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That's the subject. The Son of His love. The Son of the Father's eternal love. This is why the Son is known to be preeminent in all things. Because He is the preeminent one to the Father. He is the Son of His love. And it is, it's as though the Father, when He creates all things through the Son, for the Son, by the Son, to the Son, because He doesn't do anything apart from the Son, when He sends the Son into creation, who does the Father reveal the Son to be? 
Of course, the preeminent one, the one who is above all things without competition, taking first place above all things. This is Jesus Christ. This is who he is. And so when the Father reveals the Son to us for who he is, in, in the Son's relationship to the Father, in the Son's relationship to all things in creation and in redemption, when we, when, when we see who Christ is, the intention is that our hearts join in this song. And I think that that is the point of this song. That our hearts would be affected like Paul's in such a, in such a degree that when we have an awareness of who Christ is, who He is, in relationship to all things, our hearts would be tuned to this praise. And so, I would say to you this, that your affections and your heart desiring Christ more as you see Him more, here in this passage, I believe is a sufficient response. It is the fitting response. And the reason why I say it's sufficient is because I think in, in many ways we, th we too much rush in our thoughts about, okay, what do we need to do? What, what do I need to do? I need to do more. I need to bear fruit more. I need to be more obedient, which are good thoughts. But the response here is worship. The response here is love Christ as the Father loves Him. If we rush too quickly to what we must do, we might miss out on something deeper, on, on, on a deeper heart level work of a treasuring and finding Christ as satisfying and seeing Him as preeminent. And the reason why I say that it is sufficient to, for, for us, considering who Christ is, the sufficient response being that of worship is because whenever we're treasuring Christ and whenever we're valuing Christ, it will move into the way that we live. Whenever we treasure Christ for who He is, how could I not live in a fitting way that matches that value? And so whenever I'm valuing Christ, there is that inner work that will work in and then through me. I will want to see Him valued out there. I will want to see Him valued in my work, in my home, here in the body of believers. I will want to see Him lifted up. Whenever I see Him preeminent, and I see Him as one to be worshipped in my heart and mind, then I will want my life to reflect that estimation of His value. And so, don't rush too quickly to what you must do, those imperatives. Those will come. And whenever you have a high estimation of the value of Christ, seeing Him for who He is above all things, then you will look at those imperatives and say, that's fitting. That's right. I want that. But here, right now, the heart, the, the work is a heart level work. And I believe that that is the intention uh, for our response here. And so, what is the message of this uh, text? That all well, the scope is all things. This passage is showing who Christ is in relationship to all things, in relationship to the Father, and in relationship to all created things, both in creation and in redemption. And so, this message is not only the heart of the Colossian letter. The scope is all things. This message, this truth about who Christ is as preeminent above all things is really the message of all revelation. It is the message of the whole Bible and that's why we say that all of Scripture points to Christ. The whole Bible is communicating to us that Christ is above, preeminent above all things. 
And so all things have their right place, their right fit, only in relationship to Christ. And apart from that relationship, it does not fit. Nothing can be seen rightly for what it truly is apart from relationship to Christ. That is what it means that He is preeminent. In the book of um, Revelation, we, we see that in Revelation, the end of all things. And not just the end in finality uh, or chronologically, but the end as in the reason, the revealing of the reason of all things, the substance of all things revealed. And at the very first verse we read, Jesus Christ is that revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you keep on reading and you get to the fifth chapter, you read about a scroll, a scroll with seven seals. And in order to understand what this scroll is, what does a scroll do? Well, a scroll, when you, when you unravel it, there is something that is being revealed. It's revealing what is written. And so as you reveal or as you unravel this scroll, there is revelation. This scroll, I believe, is the revelation of all things. The revelation of all things. And there are seven seals on it. Seven meaning completion. The, the revelation of all things. And we find that there is, well, John sees that there is no one worthy to open this scroll and its seven seals. And I believe that those seven seals correspond to the days of creation. All things, all things created, the heavens and the earth, and then that seventh day, the day of rest, a finality. And we see that when it came to the point in which uh, the scroll was to be o re ready to be opened, Paul sees that there is no one worthy. There's this angel that cries out with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals? And then John sees that there is no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth that is worthy to open this scroll, to reveal all things. And he begins to weep loudly because no one was worthy to open it or look into it. And the reality is, is that we all would be weeping loudly. All of creation is groaning for this revelation of all things. And if that scroll is not opened, there will be utter despair. If that scroll is not open, there will be confusion. Nothing makes sense. If that scroll is not open, there will be darkness. If that scroll is not open, then injustice and sin continues. And why do I say that? Because as each seal is broken, there's judgment. And that judgment is working a new creation. That judgment is against all that is against the Son, all that is wrong. And so that as each seal is broken and opened, there is the working of a of redemption, of creating a new heavens and a new earth. And then we see an elder comes to John as he's seeing this and weeping. And it's like the elder places his hand on his shoulder and says, Weep no more. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David, he is worthy to open that scroll and its seven seals. He has conquered. Who is that? It's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ, the only one worthy to reveal all things because he is the reason for all things. And so, 
it says in that same revelation, He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. In our, in our text, He is before all things. It, he is the one through whom and by Him and for whom all things were created. And whenever He went forth into that creation that was created through Him, He was perfectly uniting Himself to that creation by becoming man and brought about the fullness of redemption of that creation by the blood of His cross. That's what we see in our text. And then whenever he's, He rose again, He rose as the God-man. So you see Him perfectly representing all of who God is, and then also representing all of who, who, all of creation and all of who man is in Him. And therefore, He is the only one worthy to open this scroll and its seven seals in order to be the revealer and revelation of all things. And I believe that the song that we're reading here in Colossians is really just an echo of this. Whenever the Son goes in triumphal procession to the Father and receives the scroll from His right hand because He's worthy, there's this song. There's this song that starts to be sung in heaven and it, and it goes like this, Worthy! Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. And then what, that's what we see in Colossians. He upholds and, and expounds on the glory of Christ and who He is and His preeminence, and then talks about what He has done in redemption by His blood. And this is good news. This is good news to us because this song is revealed to us right now. And it's not just that we need to know about what will one day be sung, but we can participate in this song right now. We don't have to wait to sing it because the fruits of the new creation is right now. And so we can join in the song right now. And as we see who Christ is in His relationship to all things, our hearts will be tuned to sing that song. Paul lifts up the preeminence of Christ to us. And then right after that, whenever we see His glory, this One who is in the midst of the throne of heaven to be praised and worshipped forever, He shows us what He's done for us. You who were once alienated and enemies of God in your mind by wicked works, yet now He, that is this preeminent one, has reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you blameless and above, above reproach in His sight. So let us continue to look to Christ and see Him for who He is, in order that hearts might be tuned to worship and praise Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for who You are.